Hi, I'm Amber. Welcome to the Lone Star Keto Podcast. Today we have a special guest, my friend Caitlin Weeks. She is a blogger, a cookbook author. She does group coaching occasionally, and she is a keto carnivore advocate. But something really, really awesome has happened. She is expecting, and very soon, matter of fact, uh, by the time this comes out, we will probably already know all about the baby. So welcome, Caitlin. Hey, Amber. Great to see you. Thank you for having me. Awesome. I, I, I can't wait to talk to you all about carnivore and pregnancy. I think this is such an interesting subject because you hear so much negativity about, oh, you can't eat keto or carnivore or breastfeed when you're when you're doing that diet because it's just not right for the baby and because they need that those carbs that glucose and i'm sure you hear that a lot yeah i mean i think on my, on my social media mostly people have been supportive and when i was at the doctor i'm <clears throat> kind of downplay it i just say you know I eat low carb or mm. i don't really go into it too much because you know, they're not, I know doctors and midwives and nurse practitioners and all those kind of people like that. Nutrition is not their specialty. So you have to remember that when you're going into that kind of situation, um, you know, that they don't study nutrition. They have a small amount of information about it. And a lot of that's coming from the government guidelines and things like that. So really you have to pick and choose what you're going to share and why and all that kind of stuff. So I just kind of say I'm, you know, eat mostly protein or I'm low carb or something like that. And that tends to not get I mean, one, I remember one of the midwives said, Oh, well, you eat plenty of fruits and vegetables. And I was just kind of like, <laughs> like, I didn't say, I didn't say much because I knew, I knew that that was going to, um, I knew that that was going to be a big deal. So that was not, I, I just kind of glossed over it. Uh, yeah, I don't blame you because like you said, that is what they're taught. That's what they believe in. I mean, I did too. I get it. I get why people think that way. And it is sometimes easier just to kind of let it go and do your thing. And, you know, if something happens, then, you know, you can discuss it further. So are you going with the midwife still? Yeah. Um, okay. The, the reason, I mean, I, I'm, I'm having a baby in the hospital, but my midwife, midwives are part of the hospital system. Um, I'm going to Vanderbilt. And so um, they have, you can see them all the way through your birth. Uh, and they, they only, they, of course they work under a doctor if need be. And they, they would call the doctor if there was an emergency, but Right. They're nurse practitioners that are midwives and they can see you all the way through. And the reason I did that was because, you know, more holistically minded and they uh, choose, they automatically do, don't do a lot of things. Uh, so it's like on the list of things. So you, things you don't even have to ask for, it's like co delayed cord clamping, for example. Mm. So they're just it, less... They're less into the drugs and less into the cutting and less into the, mm -hmm. uh, the hurry. They, they believe midwives in general believe that you should let birth occur as it's and not try to speed it up or any of those things. So that's why I wanted a midwife. And then I also got a doula who's going to come with me oh. as well. That's so. really cool. I would have loved to have done that too, but um, that was you know, a long time ago and they didn't really have midwives as part of hospital systems or anything like that. I mean, you could do it, but you're pretty much left to stay at home. And my husband was like, uh, no, because if there's an emergency, you're not going to be able to get you or the baby to the hospital quick enough if something really bad happened. So unfortunately I couldn't, so, but I think that is super cool. And I love that. And I can't wait to hear about that experience, but uh, obviously you feel very confident with, with, with this one. I mean, I, because you're going to be, I mean, it's one of the best hospitals in the country. So you're going to be in there anyway. So if anything goes wrong, like you, you have every, I mean, they have heart surgeons for babies and they have, you know, they have everything there. So, um, you know, I know that's there if I needed anything extra. 
That's awesome. So how has it been being Craig pregnant during this whole crazy COVID thing? I mean, things are different, right? I mean. Yeah, it's, it's been, I mean, the main thing that was hard at first was my parents. I usually, I live about, I'm like you, I live near my whole family. And so uh, at first my parents were really freaking out and they didn't want to see, they didn't really want to get together and stuff. And that was really hard for me because I'm used to seeing them like constantly. And so, but now they've loosened up a little bit and, and we have like some barbecues in the yard and things like that. So it's gotten a little better and they feel comfortable kind of when you're outside, but they don't really want us inside, which is fine. <laughs> and so, you know, I just, I felt very isolated at first. Mm -hmm. um, and then but it's gotten better. So, you know, but those first couple months were rough when yeah. everything was in the news. And, and I mean, it's, of course it still is, but I think people now have figured a way to cope and just kind of like, well, we have to move on with life. We can't just mm -hmm. stay stuck inside forever. So we just have to figure out a way to, to move on somehow. What, what about the, the visits, the doctor visits? I, I, I know even like with my grandbaby going to uh, the pediatrician to get checked, it, there's like this whole different thing going on. It wasn't too bad. Um, I think they, they spread them out. They offer some televisits, but I didn't really, I didn't really want to deal with that because they wanted you to buy like a blood pressure monitor. They wanted you to buy like a fetal heartbeat thing to do wow. the home the home visit and I'm like I don't want to buy a bunch of stuff that I'm not going to use and then and when you go to the doctor they space people out so much you don't even see anyone you'll only see the, the nurse or the the people in the office the work there so there's really not I didn't find it to be very scary and and um so I think they've done the way they do it, you're not sitting at where maybe in the past you've been to a doctor and there's a hundred people sitting in the waiting room. They don't do that anymore. So it kind of took care of itself. That's not too bad. Okay. So during, during the birth, I'm assuming they're going to allow your husband in. Yeah. They, they said they allow the, the, the doula and my husband, but if I didn't have the doula, they wouldn't have anybody she's not considered a visitor because she's certified doula but so if I only brought my husband like I couldn't bring my mom or something for example right okay so that I had her because it's like I get that extra person yeah I, yeah, I just that part yeah. person. that breaks my heart because like with me I had I was a well I mean, with my daughter, when she had uh, my grandbaby, I was able to be in the room. So was my, my husband. And so there was three of us, you know, the, the father and then the grandparents in, in the room. And that was so incredibly special. So I was wondering how much of that is allowed right now. I'm assuming not, obviously. So, you know, that's kind of sad, but I'm glad at least you get your husband. I mean, I've heard so many horror stories about hospitals, you know, nobody gets visitors and et cetera, you know, in some areas. So I, I'm glad that you know, you have that. Yeah. I mean, I would freak out if I couldn't do that. And yeah, you know, my, since my parents are older, they don't even want to, they kind of don't want to go to the hospital anyway. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So that worked out. Okay. Well, good. <laughs> I'm glad you're going to have somebody with you and, and plus an extra person. So that's all good. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. Okay. So you have battled with Hashimoto's. And how has that played into the pregnancy? I mean, has it gotten worse? Has it stayed the same? Have you noticed any, any difference? Well, I've heard this from other people. I mean, I think your body kind of naturally suppresses some of your autoimmune symptoms and stuff when you are pregnant because your body kind of puts the baby first as far as nutritional needs and all that. And so it'll take from you and give to the baby, <laughs> whatever. So you're always last, I, as far as I understand. Um, I saw my antibodies did drop some, which is weird because you'd think maybe they would go up because you're having more going on in your body or something. 
but they were down. Um, I only, I only tested that once and it was maybe a month ago. And then, um, my doctor, I have a, a nurse practitioner I go to normally and she, I like nurse practitioners a lot better than doctors. Um, she said that my doc, my, she said she w wanted to increase my thyroid medication because she thought that if I did it, that maybe my, that the baby would steal from me or that I would steal from the baby thyroid mm -hmm. hormone if I didn't have enough from my medication. Wow. That, that's what would happen. So she said, I want to increase it for like maybe three months postpartum and then you can go back down to, so I was like, sure, whatever you think, <laughs> whatever you think. <laughs> so I was like, I don't want to mess up the baby's thyroid before it's even born. So. Yeah. Well, yeah. See, that's the things you, you just don't know. And, and you don't want to take the chances. I mean, you're growing this other human and, and you don't want that human to have to have the same issues you did. So yeah, that's gotta be kind of scary, but. I don't guess, is there any harm in upping it if you don't need it? I mean, it wasn't a lot. I don't know. She didn't, she, I mean, she really is a thyroid expert. So okay. I kind of yield to her because I've been going to her for about two years or so before that. So, and, you know, I've been feeling the best that I have felt in 10 years since. Yay you know, doing carnivore and seeing her and stuff. So awesome. I just kind of listen to her. So do you still feel good? I mean, obviously you're probably going to get tired quicker in the typical pregnancy things, but I mean, do you, you feel inside like, like you still feel good, like before you were pregnant? Yeah. I mean, I mean, my biggest problem and why I went carnivore was I just had terrible digestion, very slow digestion. We've talked about that on mm -hmm. last time. And um, so that has continued to not be an issue on when I'm pregnant. So I, I do take a little bit of that. I take some magnesium pills are called magnesium SRT. And uh, that's from Jigsaw. They are really a, a well absorbed magnesium. Um, I think a lot of the magnesium pills are just crap. So uh, I take that and, but I mean, my digestion has been totally fine the whole time. And, um, you know, my energy is pretty good. I mean, I, good. I didn't get morning sickness. Uh, I oh. had, I kind of had an aversion to red meat in the first three, mm. uh, maybe the first the first six weeks, I think I didn't feel anything different. Then the second six weeks, I felt like I didn't want to cook red meat or I could, like if it went through Wendy's, I could eat a hamburger if somebody else like handed it to me, but I couldn't make it. You know what I mean? Like, uh -huh. but then that went away after my first trimester that went away. So that first trimester I ate more chicken and fish and, um, I ate a lot of goat cheese and, um, yeah, we were in Florida for in February, so we ate a lot of, for the whole month of February, we were in Florida <laughs> right before the, everything changed. <laughs> yeah, and so I ate a lot of, of seafood that time, and then um, I did have some, I, I have had sugar cravings a lot, so mm. I have done some dark chocolate, or um, I tried to eat a little bit of berries here and there, but it's, it's not, it doesn't really work because it ends up becoming like the next thing it becomes like a watermelon, <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> it starts with a little container of raspberries or something. And then it's like, well, let's, yeah. So it's like <laughs> our problems are still there. You know, there's nothing mm. or like, I'll try to eat a, a pint of rebel or something. And that's okay because I, it's like individually served or whatever, like it's one portion. But the problem is I got super congested whenever mm. I eat dairy and, and even on pregnancy, right. it's way worse. So like, I will have to literally sit up in the night and cough and cough and cough. And um, because I think my lungs are smushed or something. So, <laughs> so it's like, I can't even get away with 
uh, cow dairy at all because I just start coughing and I get phlegmy and everything. So believe me, I've tried it all. But really the only, I, I am able to eat a little goat cheese and I've tried some goat yogurt and that's gone okay. Um, but really sticking with the carnivore food, at least all animal foods makes me feel the best. Um, you know, I've tried a little bit of chocolate, but sometimes even dark chocolate will give me like leg cramps. I tried a little bit of lettuce. I got horrible leg cramps just from a tiny bit of like romaine. Wow. So it's like, eh, it's not worth it. <laughs> and because when you're pregnant, and I mean, in, in all of life, but the, your sleep is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. So if I'm like, if I eat this weird thing, is it going to make me not sleep? And so you have to like weigh it out in your mind. Like, is this worth it? So you're, and usually it's not worth it. <laughs> so <laughs> you know, like, I'm just going to stick with my, like, I haven't been as much into steaks. I really like ground beef during pregnancy. Mm -hmm. I, for some reason, I mean, I can eat a, of course I can eat a steak but it's not that blood thirst that I had <laughs> before. Um, but I, but I love the ground beef, of course, fatty ground beef, probably my favorite food, eggs. So hmm. that's what I eat mostly. That's very interesting. I was going to ask the question of, did you have any unusual cravings like something you normally on carnivore would not um, want? I've eaten some pickles, <laughs> like, you know, that's a, but I think, you know, maybe that's an electrolyte thing, why people crave pickles. Um, it seems like that would make sense. Uh, Cause you know, some people just drink pickle juice as electrolyte drink. Um, so that would be, and that, because, and so I did a video about introductions, reintroductions, because I tried so many different foods on, since I've been pregnant to see if I could tolerate them. And then I would see what happened. And really the fruit side seemed to have less. So anything like cucumbers is a pickle. Mm -hmm. Avocado seems fine to me. Some people get a histamine reaction from avocado. And like I said, the fruit doesn't seem to upset my digestion. It doesn't seem to give me pain, but it totally screws up my blood sugar. So yeah. That's very interesting. So if you are in your reintroducing things, I would stick on the fruit side because vegetables just, they give me horrible pain, either like in my back or my legs or something like that. So then that's really weird. <laughs> but I hadn't really done much and I hadn't tried many foods before because I had been strict carnivore for so long so I think it is interesting because people always ask you that about reintroductions and stuff. And it's like, well, you try it, but you won't feel good. You won't feel good. <laughs> well, now, you know, yeah, but, you know, if you don't experiment, you don't know. And, that, and we're all so very different. And just because I may react to something may not mean you will. So you, you can't go, Oh, you're going to react with that. So you have to experiment. And, and I, so many people want you to just tell them that. And it's like, you can't because we're all so different. And you're, you've kind of uh, done the experimentation now. Yeah. So do you plan to breastfeed? Yes. Definitely. And, and, and when the baby is old enough to actually be able to eat some food, how are you going to feed the baby? I mean, besides breast milk. Um, I mean, I'm definitely going to, I mean, way before I was carnivore, I was into paleo and Weston A. Price and that kind of stuff. So I will definitely be following those kind of recommendations. And, you know, I think, I think egg yolks will be a good first food. Um, you know, kidney kind of cooked meat leftovers, things like that for the baby sardines. Like my nephews, mm -hmm. are two, my nephews are two and five and they, they would just eat sardines like oh my god they would just dump them out on the on the tray and they would just slurp them up so wow those are so vile oh my god that that would seems to me like that would be a food that would you know they would be very you know about eating i think they get you know they get the attitude 
I really think they get that feeling about foods from their parents a lot of times. Maybe. So like, if you're making faces and like, oh, this smells and they're going <laughs> to pick up on that, you know? So it's like, and, and she would buy them these little ones that had the tail. They're, they're tiny. They're tiny ones. Um, you know, they would have the tail. And so it's like they could pick them up. <laughs> they could pick them up. It was, they were so cute eating it because you know it's just so good for them. But yeah, dude, I have to like make them into a sardine cake or something like that. I can't just eat them like that. But they didn't know, <laughs> you know, they don't know the difference. That's awesome. I mean, it, and, and you're right because if kids don't have a preconceived notion of what something is going to be like and you just let them experiment, you know, like it, it's interesting watching my grandbaby, some of the texture she likes, some of the things she doesn't like. We found out she, well, yesterday with the barbecue we had, I found out she likes uh, the fatty end of the brisket. She does not like the lean. It's something about the dryness, I guess, the um, texture, I'm not sure, but she would spit it out every time but you give her that fatty meat oh boy she was all over that she loved it and of course she had to have a little piece of pickle along with her her meat too <laughs> i'm not sure what that's about but oh that's yeah kids need so much fat i think that's one of the biggest things the uh, biggest m missteps of the 80s 90s and you know later that giving kids skim milk and that kind of thing is so horrible for them and giving i mean i grew up with eating margarine and I don't think the, the only good fat I had was like ice cream, you know, because it has <laughs> full fat in it, you know, but then you get frozen yogurt and uh, it's like you're so your brain is just starving for fat all the time and you feel horrible all the time. So I think giving kids that access to the real fats and just fatty meats is definitely what I'm going to do. And I, I will definitely will not be giving them cereal or anything like that. If, what? If, you know, later on when they get older, it's harder, you know, can't control what they eat and stuff. So I'm sure they're going to get whatever out in birthday parties or things like that. But those first few years, I think you can really make a difference. Yeah, I totally agree. So uh, you're not going to be giving them cereal and those little teething biscuits and the little cereal. cheese puffs and the little cereal. Um, yeah, I, I cringe because I did that because that's what you're told that it's baby food. It's right there with the baby stuff. They wouldn't be selling stuff for babies. That wasn't good. Right. Oh, I could just die now, but I mean, you know, you don't know what you don't know, <laughs> but now you do. And I'm glad you're not going to, your baby's going to, you know, have a, a great head start for sure. So, Oh, Okay, so I I saw I was kind of going through some stuff about pregnancy and um, eating carnivore and etc. And I came across this one statement that I thought was oh my goodness gracious! One of the recommendations that is typical for a doctor to give a pregnant woman is to get forty five to sixty five percent of their calories from carbs, uh, which amounts to eh, somewhere around one hundred seventy five grams a day. What's your thought on that? I mean, I think that the problem is that, I mean, I, I did, I was doing very strict carnivore when I took uh, the glucose monitoring and, and I refused to do the drink that they offer because I thought, well, my body's not used to eating a large amount of sugar at one time. So I was afraid I would fail and then I might have to do subsequent testing or, you know, be labeled as a gestational diabetic. And you don't want that in your chart, you know? And then, so I said, I mean, I was shocked at when I was doing, I said, I'm just going to do my keto mojo at home. And I did it four times a day for two weeks. And they said that they said, just send, just send us the data, just write it down in a document and then just send it to us. So I did like, um, I would just do various times. I mean, they told me to do it two hours after meals, but I couldn't really keep up with that. So I just kind of did like morning, midday and afternoon and night. And, um, and the, the thing was my blood sugar barely moved over 100, but I just can't imagine if I was eating standard American diet with two to 300 carbs, 
how I would ever pass that, I don't know, because I know that I would be diabetic if I hadn't have started a low carb diet mm -hmm. 10 years ago, I would be diabetic by now. And I just don't see how the average person is ever going to pass a glucose test unless they're just very young or just very thin, or I don't know what, what I don't know how they would pass, honestly, because, and I mean, I even noticed like one day I had a really bad craving for those like smart, sweet gummy bears and they're like, they're keto friendly, blah, blah, blah. So I ate them. And then like my blood sugar, I think shot up to 130. Wow. And I was like, okay, I mean, there you go. There's, there's your evidence, you know, it's like normally my blood, like I told you, it did not even go over 100. And then all of a sudden it shoots up to 130 right after I eat these gummy bears. And I was like, which I, I mean, I love the taste of those, but, um, you know, what if I was eating that kind of stuff all day long, you know, yeah. I would never make it. And, uh, so it just showed me like what I'm doing is, it's, I mean, you're, you're asking me to pass this test. So obviously it's important. It's, it's such a contradiction, you know, but yet you want me to eat 200 carbs. Well, it makes no sense. How am I going to pass your, your test if I eat what you say? Like the evidence is right here on the meter, you know, it's crazy. I agree. I agree. It blows my mind. When I read that, I was like, well, I don't know why I would be surprised because I mean, you know, the typical person that, that is what they eat. So, you know, I, I actually am a little surprised that it wasn't higher that they recommended because you always hear stuff like, Oh, you know, the baby, they need the, the, the glucose, the sugar and et cetera. So you need to be sure to eat your carbs and the healthy whole grains and lots of fruit and stuff like that. Maybe if I had gone to a traditional doctor, which I knew better. So I think by steering away from that, I avoided a lot of that confrontation or, you know, that pushback. Yeah. Uh, and you're lucky because I think, but again, like you said, you don't really broadcast it. You don't say I only eat meat primarily, you know, that kind of yeah, thing. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't want, I don't think it's, because they wouldn't understand, they would just like, right. freak out, you need your vitamin C and everything. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we know how that goes for sure. So what have you had people tell you, you know, as far as advice that, uh, you know, like eating raw eggs and, you know, all that kind of thing? What have you been hearing? I mean, I think just like with the rest of the nutrition information from doctors, I think a lot of that stuff is out of date. Um, and I also believe like the idea, I believe in the idea of food quality over the idea of, of some of those contaminants that they're worried about or the, um, the conditions that it might cause. So I, I would, like I wouldn't eat a I wouldn't eat a conventional grocery store egg, but I would eat an egg. Like I would make a hollandaise sauce, or I would put an egg in a smoothie or something that was a pasture raised egg from a farmer. I wouldn't have any qualms about that, you know. Or um, I eat, I bought this sushi tuna that is sashimi grade tuna that's previously frozen, for example, and made kind of like a tuna um, sashimi plate, and it's like because I know that that was, I wouldn't maybe eat it right off the, the fresh part, but since it's frozen, that's what they do at sushi restaurants, you know? Um, so it's like, it, it has that middle step that kind of kills whatever may be in the fish. So I feel confident with eating that. Or, you know, if I buy cold cuts, I might buy a good brand like Applegate or something like that. Whereas, um, you know, I wouldn't buy just like the, the Kroger brand or something. Uh, so I think if you're focusing on the quality, to me that tr that overtakes the suspicion that there would be some foodborne illness or whatever they're worried about. So I think if you just use your common sense, you can make better decisions. I mean, it, it, as much I think fish is a really good food for pregnancy. We have to get our our omega threes and stuff. So. Mm -hmm. You know, and I had a craving for a while for a lot of raw fish and, hmm. you know, I just listened to my body 
And if that's what I wanted or sounded good, I was like, I was going to go for it, you know. Yeah, so long as it fits in your your idea of what good health is. I mean, it's a little bit different if you crave something odd, like, you know, eating dirt or something, then you know there's something not quite right that you need to address. And I did have some weird stuff like that. And so apparently I was nutrient, uh, you know, deficient in something. But, uh, you know, as long as you're not doing weird stuff like that, I see no reason why you wouldn't listen to your body. Because your body is very attuned, you know, your mind mind and body work together because you've got rid of all that other mess. So you, you know, and you know. yeah, I would definitely, <clears throat> but this seems like I'm not wanting fish as much now and mainly just wanting like ground beef or eggs or, and I mean, a lot of salt and electrolytes. I've been taking my Redmond, my Redmond drink, which I love. <laughs> For sure. So, you know what I, I think is funny that, that you mentioned that, that I forgot to uh, bring up is you said you had this aversion to uh, red meat for a little while. So did Nisha Salisbury. She said the same thing. And I think it was about the same timing as you. I wonder why that is. Any ideas? I heard it's because like maybe your progesterone goes up really high and that makes you have aversions to certain foods. Um, but then maybe it levels out or something like that. I would get also very, if I missed a meal in the first trimester, I would get really nauseous if I missed mm. a meal. But if, but I, as long as I ate on time and I switched, I used to eat two meals, but then I switched to three meals. So since I've been pregnant, I've eaten three meals just because it seems like you just feel, you also don't eat, you feel, you don't feel like eating a huge meal. Well, I didn't feel eat feel like eating huge meals at mm. any one time. So it's, it was better for me to just eat less. Maybe I would eat six or eight ounces of meat rather than 16, you know, that I was used to eating. So I would just eat a smaller amount three times a day. So that was better. But um, that, that makes sense. It probably also helps. Like, have you had any indigestion or anything like that? Any of those issues? A little bit of heartburn, but usually it would be, I mean, it was hard, hard to predict. I mean, you definitely get it if you ate something that wasn't really carnivore friendly. Yep. <laughs> um, but then you, you might, I might still get it if I ate eggs or meat or something, but it wouldn't last very long, maybe an hour or something, and then it would go away. So. Oh, good. Maybe take some ginger essential oil or something like that just to get it to calm down or peppermint or something like that. So in all this crazy stress going on right now, how are you coping with that? Because as you know, it's so very important, especially when you're pregnant, to, to kind of have a calmness about you because it does affect the baby. It does. So how are you dealing with that? Um, I would, I mean, I definitely don't watch the news. Uh, Good. Much. Maybe I would like to watch, if I do watch the news, it's something like, funny like Trevor Noah or something like where they rehash it, like the the evening show the night shows like the Seth Meyers or something like that where they like tell you but it's in a funny way or something mm -hmm. like that so um then I would take naps a lot every day almost I took a nap because sometimes if I wasn't sleeping good at night or if I had if I s sat up at night for a while or something because maybe I was coughing or I had heartburn or something, then I would take a nap in the afternoon to kind of compensate. Um, but that seemed to help a lot. I go to acupuncture. There's a affordable acupuncture oh. in my um, town and it's only $20 and they have them all over. It's called a community acupuncture. So you sit in a recliner with all these other, well, they, they don't have as many people now as they used to, but mm. I would go there and, um, so maybe now they have six people where they used to have 25 or something, but um, they spread you out in recliners and they just put the needles in you and you just kind of zone mm. out for an hour. And um, that's been really helpful. And I mean, I have two appointments. I'm going three times this week because <laughs> it's supposed, wow. to, supposed to stimulate your, your labor. So oh. hoping that the, that works. And um, 
So that, and I do a ton of walking. I walk at least 10,000 steps a day. Oh, good. Wow. And I try to go out, as you know, it's very hot. So mm. I live in Tennessee. And so I go out early, like before eight and walk. And then I'll go out again at like after seven or so and walk again. So I get two big walks in. And I think that helps a lot because, you know, when you work on your computer or you work in the house all day, it's, it's not good for you to be inside all the time. And so being out with nature and stuff as much as you can. And then I've, we live really close to a, a nice lake. So we've been swimming in the lake a whole, a whole lot, we go at least once a week. We go swim in the lake and have a barbecue or something like that. Oh, I love that. Good for you. Yeah, they have a lot of picnic areas around there and stuff. So Cool. Well, you got to do stuff like that for yourself. And let me just tell you, it's going to be a little bit harder to do those kind of things here in a week or two. <laughs> things get much more complicated <laughs> for a while, for a while. Well, then it gets better. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you don't know what you're going to want to. You don't know how much you're going to want to take the baby out <laughs> around people and stuff, you know, I yeah. mean, you got to be careful. Well, you always have that fear anyway, because that fear has been put into you. Oh, you're supposed to keep them home for a certain amount of time. But then on top of that, you have this COVID craziness. And so, you know, so much fear has been put into you about that. So you kind of got a double whammy. <laughs> so you're probably not going to want to take that baby out for a while. I know yeah. my daughter is still a little bit, I mean, she will take the baby out, but she's still a little bit cautious, but you know, she's, she, you just never know, I guess. And I, I don't blame her. I mean, I, if I had an infant at, at this time, I'd probably be a lot more careful about things too, especially a newborn, you know, while they're still getting their immune system and, you know, that kind of thing that hasn't really quite kicked in yet, kind of uh, depending on you for that. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, let me see what else we have here. Well, one thing I wanted to talk about was the, um, the, the high blood pressure, you know, that's oh, a yeah. thing with pregnancy is the, um, they're always looking at two things. They're looking at your blood sugar. It's so ironic because they're looking at your blood sugar and they're looking at your high, your blood pressure. So those two things they're looking at the whole time you're pregnant and, but they don't tell you and they just tell you it's, they act like it's complete chance that it's like, from the stars is how they're like any time you could get uh, gestational diabetes, any time you could get high blood pressure. And yeah, high blood pressure definitely, I would say, I mean, that's one that you need to watch for very carefully because um, any, any Downton Abbey fans, you know, <laughs> Sybil died of preeclampsia in the, in the show, spoiler alert, if it's, it's over. But <laughs> <laughs> so that was the first time I ever heard of that but um it is something that can can kill you or hurt you very quickly so it is something mm. you want to watch for your blood sugar blood pressure uh which it should be 80 over I mean 120 over 80 it shouldn't go above that now they say it could go over to 90 over 140 is when they start to consider it to be high but I would I would consider if it starts creeping up, you know, that's something to be afraid of or, you know, worry about. And I notice <clears throat> if I did have like a carb binge or something, then my blood pressure would be higher that next day. And it was like, mm. that's really weird, you know, that, I mean, it affects you that quickly. Yeah. I mean, the bodies are so sensitive. So I just can't stand it when people act like it's not dependent on what you eat because it really, really is because my blood, my blood pressure this entire pregnancy has been um, under the 120 over 80, like, you know, in the seventies and 111, that kind of thing. And so it's like, if I can see it immediately after I eat carbs going up, then I know that that is, something to, to watch out for. And, and I just think that they, for some reason, there's no personal responsibility as far as what I see in, pre in pregnancy. It's like, 
oh, it, it can happen at any time. Like, if for both of those things, it's like, yeah, it can, but there is a lot we can do about it. And I've meant, you know, mentioned that and they're like, oh no, no, it doesn't matter what you do. And I'm like, and you know, a lot of people that have gestational diabetes when they're pregnant, it is, I, I believe a determining that you might have it after. It's yes. Not, it's not just like a, oh, it just happened then. Like, no, it's, it's a sign that it's something you need to work on and I mean, no guilt or anything like that, but like, uh, you know, <laughs> your body's sending you signals and, and so it's like, take them, take the hint. And, you know, I know that when I get done with this, I want to be really, I want to go back to being strict as strict as strict as I can be because I want to feel my best and I want to, you know, lose the baby weight. And I mean, I'm not going to be crazy about it. I mean, whatever happens. And if, you know, if I feel depressed afterwards or whatever, I mean, I'm always going to, I'm always going to put myself, my health first. I'm not going to ever do, you know, if you go back and listen to my last podcast with Amber, I'm never going to do all that horrible stuff to myself where I was restricting and, um, and that kind of stuff. I'll never do that again. But, you know, as long as I'm happy with what I'm eating and I'm full and satisfied and I feel like I'm getting my nutrition in, then I will, you know, I want to be doing carnivore really strictly because I want to go back to feeling the best that I did before I got pregnant. So, um, yeah, I mean, I just feel like the two biggest challenges you're going to have in your pregnancy is going to be passing that blood sugar test and keeping your blood pressure low. And so your nutrition is going to have a huge impact on that. And, you know, don't let them, don't believe that you can't impact it because you really, really can. You do have some control. Yes, there are factors that you can't control. Okay, fine. But like you said, where is the personal responsibility? Not only that, but you have another life you're, you're dealing with here too that could be affected. Nutrition does matter. But, you know, we don't know what we don't know. Because like what you said, that's kind of the attitude is, oh, well, if it happens, it happens, but we have to deal with it. But we're going to watch it. We're going to do these tests, whatever. But there's nothing you can do. <laughs> Uh, that's baffling. <laughs> now, th no wonder people don't know that. It's not their fault. It's not about shaming them, but ugh, the information is just not there. I well, mean, they it, told it, me it is if you dig for it. <laughs> yeah, you have to, just like every other thing in, in every other health journey you might be on, you have to be your own advocate and speak up yourself. And yes, you know, they give you the idea like, just don't eat salt. It's like, uh, that's not the thing. I'm like, and, and they did say drink a lot of water. Well, I mean, I do that anyway. So I can't imagine that anybody could make it through pregnancy without drinking a lot of water. That seems insane because no, but <laughs> yeah, if you're drinking Diet, Diet Coke or Coke all day. You're, you're going to be pretty feeling pretty bad. Mm, yeah. No, <laughs> that's so much junk in there. Can you just imagine? And, and, you know, again, you know, what you eat also affects the baby too. And so if you're, you know, doing things that are hurting your body, you know, it's going to affect theirs too. So nutrition yeah. absolutely does matter. Yeah. And I have, I really wanted to give my baby the best food that I could and, and, give him the best start. I mean, and, and not start him out as a sugar addict, you know, right out of the gate. Yeah. Uh, so, and hopefully breastfeeding will work out and I'll continue to eat well. And, um, you know, three meals of eggs and meat and fish and whatever like that. So, so what are you going to do if for some reason you can't breastfeed? What options do you have? Well, um, I'm gonna, I mean, the first things first is having a lot of support. I think a lot of people give up too soon. Uh, I mean, my sister's been breastfeeding on carnivore for two years, so she's a big rah-rah cheerleader for that. 
come. You know, I think if you're your doctor or your midwife or your doula or you, you need support. So you need, a lot of hospitals have also a lactation consultant that comes around. So you have to request that. Um, you know, you don't just suffer in silence. I think a lot of people, uh, there's also La Leche League meetings. I mean, maybe they're virtual now. Um, so I think a lot of people don't get the support or, or they just only listen to their doctor who says, oh, it's not a big deal, just forget it. You know, it's too much trouble. You know, if you don't have that advocate saying, try, try, try again, you know, really pushing you because it is gonna be, I mean, from everything I've heard, <laughs> that you can, that you have to try hard and you have to push through. And sometimes, especially if you want it really bad for your baby. And so, I mean, that's just what everyone's told me that they just, the people who did make it work just kept on trying and they kept getting more help and that kind of thing. So I think a lot of people give up too soon. That's the first thing. Um, or they just don't have this, the support. And so get, getting those people lined up beforehand that we're going to show you, no, do this, no, do that, put, change this around, you know, um, and the attitude, having that attitude of you're going to make it work no matter what. I mean, my sister had an emergency surgery right after her birth. And so she wasn't able to breastfeed that first few days. And, you know, you might think that that would be a deterrent that would uh, keep you from breastfeeding altogether. But she was like, no way, I'm not, you know, even though the baby had the formula the first week, she was like, I'm not going to give up. And as soon as she got out of the hospital and she got home, she started, you know, on a routine and she got it to work, you know? So wow. I think you just have to be very persistent and, um, and then you know, there's the myth that it's not going to work on carnivore. Well, she has had no problems with her flow and uh, all that. She's still breastfeeding two and a half years. Her, her baby's wow. two, two and a half years old. He just, I mean, he eats tons of food and stuff now, but she, she will breastfeed him sometime. I mean, at night, it's more of like a comfort thing. It's not really a, more as a food thing anymore. It's more of just like okay, just to pacify her sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I mean, I'm sure she's, she's winding it down, but you know, it's just so easy. Once you get it going, it's, you know, you always have something, if you're trying to fly on a plane or, you know, anytime you need something to calm them down, you, you've got it right there. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I'm hoping I can make it work. And then uh, the other thing is, I know Weston A. Price has a formula mm -hmm. recipe. I think it uses goat milk powder, something like that, and then some other um, added things so that it's balanced out. And I mean, I think it's pretty expensive to make, but you know, formula is expensive anyway, so it probably is the same. Um, and then I know you can use some there's people who do breastfeeding banks, they bank their milk, they donate. Yeah. And then I don't know much about that, the safety or whatever. I'm sure mm -hmm. that they have some sort of protocols that they've used so that it's safe. Um, I mean, the only problem with that is that you don't know what that person was eating True. who gave it to you. But I mean, I, I would say it's probably still better than formula um, <laughs> unless that person was like a vegan or something. Um, hopefully not. So, but you know, if you read the ingredients on formula, I just, I just don't think I could give that to my child because it's like the first ingredients are corn syrup and to uh, soy. Terrible. And, Terrible. Um, I, I just don't, I don't understand because I just, the ingredients are so bad. <laughs> and I, I think also getting involved just like with carnivore, it's really important to get involved with community and talk mm -hmm. to other people, other moms, what are they doing? What's working for them? That kind of thing. Because some people have a lot of knowledge and you just have to tap into it and, and get involved and you can solve a lot of your problems just by having those supportive people around you. I could not agree with you more. And speaking of which, if you could give 
a simple advice to somebody who is pregnant or wants to be pregnant and eat carnivore, what's some advice you would give them? I mean, I think this would apply to any new carnivore person or an interested person. I just don't get so wound up in the, the minor details, you know, just eat fatty meat, eat eggs, eat fish, eat whatever you like. Um, you know, animal foods are the highest in, in nutrients that we have on earth. So, you know, you don't have to worry that your child is not going to get enough. If anything, they're not getting enough on a standard American diet. They're going to come out being depleted in some way. So um, carnivore is going to give them carnivore or keto or, you know, an ancestral template type diet is going to give them the best start in life. And, um, and for you to be strong, to carry the baby the whole time and to keep your blood sugar, to stay out of trouble with the doctors, uh, it's all, it's all there. So just don't get caught up in all the little things and don't doubt yourself. Um, just, just know that, you know, if you're eating nutrient dense foods, you know, mostly animals, you're going to be on the right track and don't worry about macros or, um, how much you're eating or anything, because it'll pretty much take care of itself. Love it. Perfect. So thank you so much for joining me, Caitlin, and I love hearing your story, and I cannot wait to meet the little one, and that's going to happen really soon, and I will have all the updated information below this. Like I said, more than likely before this comes out, she's going to have the baby, so I'll, I'll, I'll add some pictures or whatever else below that she'll have, and while you're here, subscribe to my channel, and then go follow Caitlin. She has got a wealth of information. She's an awesome person to follow, so definitely. And thanks again, Caitlin. It has been a blast, and good luck. I'm going to be uh, anxiously waiting. Thank you, Amber. You've been a good friend this whole time, so I really appreciate it. And, yeah, we'll, we'll see the baby soon, so we're really excited. Excited. I'm coming to Nashville. I really am, because I'm going to see the berries, and I'm going to visit with you. But I, I've been waiting for all this COVID stuff to get over with and for you to have the baby. So there you go. <laughs> I'll, I'll bring something really cute. So <laughs> I'm ready. Bye, Caitlin.